I'm going to hand over to Laura now to take away her uh, demonstration. This is a UX research project just for context for everyone. Thanks, Laura. So grateful that I had this opportunity to present on Veggie Saver. This was a project that we did that was, I really enjoyed it. It was a research project. Um, a little bit about myself. I am a wife, mom, teacher, artist. I live in Kansas City. I am a Montessori early educator and now turned UX designer through Harness. I love to paint, garden, forage, and just hang out with my family. And that's my goofball family right there. So who is Veggie Saver? Veggie Saver is an Australian-based retail product. They have a reusable, washable cloth bag, and it, it helps prolong the life of vegetables in the fridge. Uh, so this is a company that is looking to expand into the global market. They want to take their website and optimize it for the experience for consumers as well as wholesalers. And so the big picture, this was a seven week timeline. We had um, time for research with interviews. We had time to analyze that. And then we had time to prepare a presentation. Um, we had one senior UX research mentor. Thank you, Natalie. That was you. Um, we have 12 UX students and I was one of those students and we did collaborate just a little bit, but we did come up with all of our own insights and research on our own. So moving on to research process, this is kind of the process that I used. We defined first the research scope. So I created this plan, a research plan, to focus on qualitative interviews with U.S. consumers who fit the demographic, and that was U.S. women aged 25 to 55. <clears throat> Excuse me. So working together, um, all of us students, we created some interview scripts. We talked with the CEO of Veggie Saver to get a better understanding. Sorry to interrupt. Your yes, memory. yes, go ahead. Just wanted to get the visuals right so for you. Um, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I presenting speaker view? Uh, or you, you're... you are, you are, yes. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Okay, let me fix that. Okay. Thank you so much for catching me on that. No problems. Take a moment to, to restart. Okay, yeah, I've got it. Thank you. Okay, is that better? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So anyway, um, with our interviews, uh, we got a better understanding of the specific topics that we needed to research when we talked with the CEO and the stakeholders at Veggie Saver. We got an idea of what they are looking for, uh, what kind of questions they're asking. Um, so after we talked with them, I, we, I pulled apart what they wanted to know. Um, I moved into the qualitative research with interviews and I did eight interviews again with the tar target demographic. Then um, I also looked at the main competitor for Veggie Saver. One of their main competitors in the U.S. is a Veggie Bag. Um, so I looked at their website and also an adjacent product called Pelophone Case, looked at their website as well and I kind of analyzed them against Veggie Saver's website. And then I affinity mapped and I synthesized all of this data and I pulled out themes and, and then insights. And I created a persona from that to fit the target demographic in the US. There were a couple of limitations for this project. So it was a short time frame of seven weeks. I had no budget to recruit, no incentivizing for participants. I couldn't recruit wholesale grocery buyers for interview partly because uh, there was no incentivizing. They just didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> um, so all the participants that I talked with as well are from the Midwest in the US of A, the Kansas City area, and they're my personal network. So those are some of the limitations for this research. So the questions that I asked based off of that initial interview with our stakeholders at Veggie Saver um, included these three things, how can Veggie Saver understand the US target demographic of women aged 25 to 55? That is the demographic of people buying in Australia. And it could be different in the US, but for the, the purposes of this project, we assumed that that would be similar to the target demo in USA. So another th question would be, how can VeggieSaver.com be improved and optimized for wholesale and direct to consumer? Their website currently was really aiming for wholesalers, and they really were asking the question, what does our website need to be doing in America to grow our consumer base there? So 
they were looking to expand to direct to consumer. What are the implications of integrating the Amazon shop link on VeggieSaver.com? That was another big question that they wanted to know. Should they have the Amazon link on their website or not? So their ultimate goal is to have a global brand with multiple offices around the world and to bring in enough profit to free 10,000 children annually from sex trafficking through a nonprofit partner called Destiny Rescue. So this is a really mission-driven company, very purpose-driven um, brand and product. These are the consumers that I interviewed, friends of mine that I recruited. I did a blend of one-on-one -on -one interviews with usability testing as well on VeggieSaver.com. I would record my record the screen as I asked them some specific questions to navigate the website. I did interview a few people that did not fit into the target demo. Um, one was a man and the other one was younger than 25. And looking back, I think I could have actually included their data in my pool. I decided to not include it as I processed and analyzed the data. Um, that might have been something that I would have done differently looking back. So all of the women I interviewed were from low, low income to upper class. It was a wide range of socioeconomic. They were regularly buying produce. They were all mothers. They all valued non-toxic living and environmental stewardship they were all motivated to save money in their households too. I also interviewed three businesswomen as part of my pool. And one of them in particular had quite a bit of insight on direct uh, to consumer retail. She had two businesses that were primarily selling through her websites. So she gave me quite a bit of good information as well as her husband used to be a wholesaler for Whole Foods. So while I didn't interview a wholesaler, I did get that wholesaler perspective through the understanding she had with her um, with her husband's knowledge doing that. Once I interviewed all of these women, I created an affinity map and um, a tool called Notably. I used that to uh, upload all of my transcripts, parse out all of the, the information that I had been given. I put it into different tags. I tagged everything, I themed it out, and then I pulled insights from those themes and I broke down this data um, so I, I just teased out all of the, the themes that I could, themes like um, wholesaler's perspective, things like Amazon and opinions about that, turnoffs to the product, um, things that are great about it that people liked, um, what the website needs and, and opinions about that. I found, I found a lot of information, I learned a ton doing this, um, that a lot of people, the appeal of Veggie Saver is that it saves them money and, and food waste. That's something that everybody was really attracted to about this product. They were like, oh, it's going to save me money and wasting food. I'm, I'm very much interested in this. Um, that it's made of a natural and reusable material. They liked that, that was a positive. A lot of people liked that it holds a large amount of produce too. It's not just holding your strawberries or just herbs. It is holding an entire crisper drawer pretty much worth of produce. So they thought that was worthwhile. Some critiques that people had of Veggie Saver product included that they couldn't see what's inside of it. So organizationally, they didn't know what was in the bag. Um, there was no color coding. There was no labeling. There's no organization for their produce. That was probably the biggest turnoff. Another one included um, somebody was afraid it might grow mold inside of it. They didn't know how easy it is to clean or manage. Is it another thing I have to take care of? Um, basically, there was just a few reasons why people thought this maybe not isn't for me. I may not buy this. Then I also took a little price comparison of the opinions that I had heard I had asked each participant what they what they think about the price. It was twenty five at the time that I interviewed them. Edu Veggie Saver dropped it down to twenty dollars. Um, so I got a lot of different opinions. The upper class participants were willing to pay the cost with no problem, and the lower income participants were not very willing to pay at a twenty five price point. Um, unless they had really good personal references, people that they knew who liked it and knew it worked for them. Um, one participant said, I feel like this would sell well, but I probably wouldn't buy it just to try it at this price point of $25.
So through this participant interviews, I came to see that Veggie Saver has a really big opportunity to build trust with U.S. consumers um, and to help consumers see how this product could fit into their lives and become a household brand, which is Veggie Saver's ultimate goal. Toothpaste, for example, is a product that everybody buys now, but no one needed it until consumers believed that they needed to be buying it and using it, and they trusted that toothpaste would solve their dental problems. So Veggie Saver has a potential to be a product that could save people produce cost and waste, and Veggie Saver could showcase themselves and build trust with the clientele in America that this is a must-have product for their kitchens. That's a real opportunity that I discovered for them. All of this data led me to create Kinda Crunchy Kim. She is concerned about the environment, but she wants to be very frugal. She wants to prevent food spoiling in her fridge. Uh, she's motivated to find low-cost solutions. She wants to reduce plastic trash. But she um, is looking for something that has good referrals that other people she knows are is that are they are using the product as well. She's looking for five star reviews. She's on Amazon reading reviews. She's spending a lot of money on groceries, even though she's shopping frugally at Aldi. Um, she uses storage methods for her produce that aren't working out for her currently. So there's an opportunity here for Veggie Saver for a person like Kind of Crunchy Kim. She says, I try not to waste. I feel guilty when food goes bad. Um, she's on social media on the major platforms and she's a busy millennial looking for um, help in her kitchen to help her save money and prevent food waste, but do it in a way that's non-toxic as well. So, when I conducted usability tests during my one-on-one -on -one interviews and I recorded the screens of the participants, I asked a series of questions about the website, they, the experience they were having on the website. Um, one of the tasks I gave them was to find a retailer on their website. Veggie Saver has a very cumbersome uh, find a retailer map and it wasn't very accurate and it was a very convoluted process for each participant that I, when I took them through it, um, I recorded the screen and I, and I asked another task if they could try to buy Veggie Saver on the website and none of them, well, there isn't really a way to buy it on the website. So they, they couldn't complete that task. They were frustrated by that. They wanted their, they wanted to see a buy now button somewhere. Um, U.S. consumers I had discovered were looking to believe and trust that this was a real product by looking for a buy now button, by having a consumer facing website. So these tasks that I gave them were determined as cumbersome and their participants stated they would just rather buy this on another, like on Amazon. They would just go search for it in Google, find it on Amazon and buy it there. Um, they wanted a quick and easy way to buy this and didn't like find a retailer uh, looking for somebody to buy it near them in their city. I also conducted a competitive analysis with veggiebag.com and veggiebag is a US based produce bag. It is more expensive, but it does the same thing. It does it less effectively than the veggie saver bag, um, which has been scientifically proven to produce, to uh, elongate the life of produce in the fridge. So veggie, veggiebag.com, uh, they did a couple of really great things with their website. It was very minimalistic. It was clean. It had very professional photos, videos of their product. It had a pop-up that asked for consumers information with an offer of a discount. It was a very consumer focused website and it looked like a very, um, elevated product so that it also had a way to buy the product on the website with different options of quantities and qualities and photos of those things. Um, I don't have any data though on how well this site was performing for this company. So I don't really know how effective their website is for them. It's just things that I noticed looking at this website, comparing it with what Veggie Saver is doing right now and noticing that this is a consumer focused website that has a very professional look to it um, and is selling its products on its website. 
And this is just another example of veggiebag.com. The buy now button is front and center. It is large and easy. Uh, the copy is very to the point, punchy, catchy. Um, it highlights its features, organic cotton, um, keeps produce vibrant for two weeks. That's what it, what it does is what it's saying it does, very obvious for the consumer. So I pointed these things out in my research report to Veggie Saver and ways that they could change the website to help them build trust with US consumers for Veggie Saver. Another product that I looked at was Pelophone Case. This is an adjacent product. It's in the sustainability realm. Um, it's a phone case that's compostable. Their website was fantastic because it was focused on consumers, but it also had wholesaler. They were also courting wholesalers on their website with um, lots of ways to shop. And it was very professional, lots of photos, lots of tabs for wholesaler at the bottom and the uh, footing, the footer. So they were reeling in retailers with tantalizing perks and selling them even before sign up. Um, and being on fair.com as well as an advantage for a company like this in a similar product space. So some key insights that I drew out, Veggie Saver has room to improve its consumer communication and its function on its website. A consumer targeted website with a buy now link really conveys legitimacy to American consumers. That's what I heard from my participants um, during my research. The US target demographic is motivated to save money in food waste. So there is an opportunity for this product here in America to take off. Um, and people are more likely to buy this product if they have good reviews, five star reviews, good referrals from people that they know using it. So those reviews are really important to showcase on the website. Another key insight is that most women know that Amazon is contributing to a larger problem. Most um, consumers know that, but they, they still want to participate in Amazon because it is convenient and easy. Most of US is shopping on Amazon. So it's got free shipping, the subscriptions are easy. Um, these are commonly used things. So a couple of interviewees said they would actively try to buy Veggie Saver at a local store first or on another platform just to try and curb um, environmental um, effects, negative effects, but they would still probably buy it on Amazon if that was just the easiest way to do it. So once in a store, it's important to make sure that a product is easy for a wholesaler to sell. This is something that I learned talking with the business owner who uh, her, has, has, her husband was a wholesaler. And she said that um, brokers can be helpful in advocating for a product in stores, but they can be costly. What wholesaler buyers might want is free fills or free product and marketing display materials to help them sell the product. If it could hang, if it could have a kiosk, some way to sell their product, that could be something Veggie Saver could come into the relationship with Whole Foods, for example, and say, hey, we will give you a certain amount of free veggie bags, Veggie Saver bags, as well as a display for them to help sell these. If you can please put it in the produce area where it sells the best as a add-on item and impulse buy. So based off of my research, I came up with these recommendations for Veggie Saver. And there's an opportunity here for them. How might we improve the website to communicate trust to consumers with a more convincing website experience? So adding that buy now button front and center on their website, um, having professional photos and videos showing the size of the product and it being used in a kitchen um, would be really great. Some people just didn't know how big this was until I had explained it to them that it wasn't obvious on the website. Five-star reviews and positive accolades could be really helpful, again, right away up high on the website. Another recommendation I have is how might we use social media to drive sales to the website? So affiliate influencers and partnering with social media, um, gaining influencers to share this, especially if the target demographic is women 25 to 55 who are on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok using the power of social 
um, influencers to sell this product. It could really do well. Also ad campaigns, if there's a budget for that, um, Facebook ads, or this could be a very easy clickable ad impulse buy. How might we show consumers the accurate size and function on VeggieSaver.com? So it didn't have American inches of how big the product is. It was all in the metric, which Americans, we just don't understand metric. Um, we need to know American inches or have it in a kitchen so we know the proportions and, and how it's being used. Um, and also emphasizing that this is a product that saves money. Veggie Saver, when we interviewed with them, made it very clear that this product can pay for itself within just two weeks of using it because of saving produce from going bad. So making that clear upfront to consumers to show them that this is really a frugal product, even though there's an upfront cost. How might we partner with meal kit services and also grocery subscriptions? This could be an upsell item. Uh, when you're checking out of a meal a meal kit subscription, or it could be added to a meal kit to, to hold the ingredients for a subscription box. So those are some creative options. There, it could be tricky. And when I did talk with Veggie Saver and present to them, they said they had explored doing meal kits and there was it was just a little too complicated to work out so that they had already explored that option. Whoops. So... If I had more time, I would have interviewed with wholesalers if I could have incentivized any of them to speak with me about what they would like to see in a, a product coming into their store, how, how they would like to work with, with products like this. Um, I also would have liked to have done more usability testing on finding the retailer feature on the website, which seemed really cumbersome, seemed like something that could have been, um, I could have done testing on that to see ways in which I could have made that better. Um, so there's a, so there's some of the things that I would like to have done if I had more time or incentive for finding more interview subjects. I learned so, so much doing this project. I had a lot of fun talking to participants and learning from them what their experience is. I learned a lot about how to conduct research and how to tease out information. So thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate that I got to do this project. Thank you, Laura. That was amazing. Um, also really clear and, and well presented. Uh, over to the panel who would like to provide some feedback to Laura's presentation. Chad, feel free. Laura, the visual design of this presentation, you absolutely crushed it. <laughs> absolutely oh, thank you. crushed it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I loved the way it looked. It was simple, clear crushed it um so i just want to emphasize that first so job well done and obviously you communicated uh amazing um so i just want to emphasize that as well so great job on that um all right so a couple of things that stood out to me is it's small nitpick things um uh, you don't have to talk about the tools again i said that from before you don't have to talk about the tools um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, really what matters is the insights and that kind of stuff and uh, recommendations. Um, in addition, um, I had a comment here. Did you connect the findings to the objective? I'm not sure if you did or not. I think you did at the end. Um, but when you recommended all the insights and the recommendations at the end, I mean, it totally put a nice bow on that package and then delivered it. So I thought that was really good. Um, there was a moment in one slide where you were talking about the pricing. Um, again, just a small nitpick. Uh, and you talked about an opportunity, a really cool, it was about toothpaste and the relationship between toothpaste and it was a yeah. need. But if you kind of articulated that as opposed, like, cause it was a little, it, it was a little disjointed in terms of showing the pricing. But if you kind of like put a slide to that, that would have been um, super, super helpful. Um, cause that's an Do awesome- Do you mean add another slide about what toothpaste did in an industry? Well, about the relationship. No, no, because you said something about how you could. It's almost like a recommendation you included yeah. inside the bar, inside the pricing area. I, I think. Oh, I, I see I, what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and metaphors are great, right? We love metaphors or just you know analogies uh, from previous um, examples, um, and also like you know um, like affinity mapping and usability testing and, and all these different kind of methods like 
why did you choose to use those methods? I don't, I, mm, excuse me if I forgot. That's a good question. I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if you told me why, like, why did you do that? I don't know. Like, you know, I'm, I guess I'm yeah, just going to trust I didn't that you didn't tell did. why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, though. Yeah. <laughs> and then how did and, and why would these help you achieve your objective? Right. Because at the end, they said the objective you had in the beginning, how does all the stuff help you at the end? Um, and then the last thing I'll say is uh, the and the last slide or the second from the last slide. Um, and the previous um, um, a person did that, too. Sorry, I forgot your name. Um, no worries. I wouldn't emphasize like I wouldn't emphasize if I had more time. Like I think you say, okay. if I had more time, just say my next steps would be this or this, right? Don't even say okay. would be this. Okay. My next steps are this, right? Because like if if I had more time, it's like I don't know. It's almost kind of like complaining a little bit, but not really. I don't know how to explain it in a in a better, more articulate way. But I would just say a better way, just to kind of um, tie it up, is just say, and my next steps are going to be this. Yeah, that's, that's uh, all a I lot got. more concise. Thank you. That's yeah. great. But it looked amazing. Thanks, Chad. Yeah, awesome. thank you. I uh, just told uh, my students today that um, I gave some really similar feedback about the, you know, if I had more time sort of situation where the language that you should be using in interviews and stuff should be really committed. Um, and really like as if you are still in the project or, you know, if you fully have off work in the project, that's fine. But like, um, really kind of framing it rather than as a student project, but as like just a project um, without these sort of time limits or, you know, what have you, those sorts of things. Um, beautiful job. Um, I, I'll just like go ahead and go into my feedback. Um, but uh, so one thing I wanted to say was uh, like, depending on the type of role that you're kind of going for, I would definitely adjust um, the way that you're presenting this work somewhat. Um, so if you are looking into more like marketing focused roles where you are doing like landing page designs and stuff, I think it's spot on perfect. If you are going to be using this in sort of like more of an interview for so like maybe a software as a service sort of role or some like internal, like a very different type of role, um, you might want to talk more about like lean more on the insights that are about the surface um, rather than like the market insights, you know, like the pricing stuff might not matter as much in for those other roles. So uh, just depending on the type of interview that you're doing with the type of company, I would probably like adjust to have two different versions of this uh, presentation so that it's uh, maybe a little bit more tailored to the type of research that you would be doing in those roles. And that's just like okay. general um, sort of feedback, um, but yeah, that's really great if you're applying for like a of agency where they do a lot of these sort of like landing pages um, and that sort of thing. Um, and then there was one other thing that stood out uh, while explaining that you didn't have real data from Veggie Bag. So this is kind of similar to Chad's feedback where it's like, you know, kind of presenting it like a student project. Um, you could note like instead how you could bridge that knowledge gap by maybe doing a comparative, like some sort of comparative study, you know, a preference task, something like that in order to see how people feel qualitatively, um, it is allowed that you can like go ahead and test other people's products. There's, there's no rule. Oh against. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Really yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that makes um, a lot of sense. Thank you. No problem. Um, and then the the last thing is, is just a nitpicky sort of uh, slide design sort of thing where I would consider having like different useful visuals um, for each of your recommendations, because right now they're just, it's just one image with each of your recommendations. Yeah. I always like to be able to see examples of how you might uh, apply some of that, like even if it wasn't a design project, it's always great to know that a researcher can like actually articulate how they would make changes in product uh, and make suggestions, even if it doesn't end up being the final design. Yeah, um, absolutely. Awesome. Great job. Thank you so much. Thanks, Becca. Awesome. Emily. Uh, Laura, it's so nice to see Veggie Saver uh, on my computer Yay. screen again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for bringing that to me. Um, again, beautiful presentation. Uh, you, I mean, Chad was right. You just absolutely nailed the visual presentation component of this. Um, and I think someone in the questions asked this as well. So I'm going to kind of embed this in my feedback to you. Um, 
you hit like the four things that I care about most when I, when I'm trying to hire a researcher and I'm looking at their portfolio and their presentations, like the things I care about are how, like, what did you do? What were your actual methods? And what was your thought process in coming to those methods? Like, I want mm -hmm. to understand how this person thinks as a researcher and how they approach problems and how they match problem objective research method together. Um, so like really making that clear, um, like almost overly clear, especially if you're doing like an interview process and, you know, cause that's what this basically is, is you're presenting your case study as though you're on your like, you know, interview loop, you've, you've kind of moved forward in the interview process and you're showing us yeah. how great you can do this. I want to know, like, what is this person? If I release this person into the wild as a researcher in my company, how are they going to make decisions about methods and timelines and resources and things like that? Um, I love that you included some of the assumptions that you were making going into this and like some of what your biases were, because I think it's really important as researchers that we're very clear about what we're assuming about a product or what we're assuming about um, people's expectations and, and um, acknowledging what our biases are, because you know, as humans, we can't ever completely undo bias. And so just being aware of our biases, acknowledging them and trying to show what we did to try to mitigate those biases is really crucial. Um, I agree with uh, uh, Chad and I think Rebecca also touched on this was the like um, next steps. Um, like we all, <laughs> you and I know that there are always limitations to a research study. Um, there are always things that we didn't have time for. There are always things we would do more of or do differently if we had more time. Um, but just framing that as like, and here is what I would do next. And um, here are the other, uh, like, here are the questions that one of the horrible, great things about research is that you end up generating as many questions as you answered with that project. Um, and so yeah, like, totally. being able to lay out, here are the remaining questions or here are like the additional questions I have and how I would approach those or like what I would want to do next. Um, and then like the recommendations if this is a project that you've been able to continue on with for some time, you might even be able to show like actual impact on the website or the product or something like that. And like impact is like the dirty word that we all care about um, <laughs> trying to show is like, what, why did this matter? Like, great. We learned a bunch of cool stuff. Learning stuff is cool. Um, love it when people get to learn, but like the business cares about why does this matter that we learned something? What was the actual impact that this will have on the product or on our business? Um, and so, yeah, with that, like I would have the only, like the only real, here's what I would change kind of thing is just being really clear about how you came to your methods and what each step of your process was. Um, maybe have some examples of the kinds of questions you asked during the interviews. Um, some questions about how you, um, you and I know that this was based on like the inter stakeholder interview and stuff like that, but how you decided who to talk to or like what the demographic should be, um, how you decided on one-on-one -on -one interviews to begin with, um, why you did the competitive analysis with Veggie Bag, um, you know, like intuitively I know why that matters, but um, assume your interviewers are, you know, very smart children and need to be told why you did that thing. Um, and like, especially with the stakeholder interview, um, I think that a lot of people underestimate the importance of really talking to their stakeholders as a researcher and really understanding like their hopes and dreams. Um, because PMs, designers, um, business leaders will come to you and be like, I want to know this thing. And sometimes that's the thing they want to know. Um, sometimes they're right about that, but part of our job as researchers is to actually also help them understand what they don't understand and what they actually need to learn. Um, and so going into a little more detail on how you did the stakeholder interview and how you engage with your stakeholders up front would have been perfect. Yeah, I remember with our, our veggie saver stakeholders that when we got to asking the questions, it was almost like they were having a brainstorm session with us. And 
billions of questions just came out of them. And it was pretty messy to try and like narrow it down for the sake of this project. So yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. And getting that out of them and figuring out what to focus on uh, is really important. So, and, and uh, yeah, showing how I, how we did that is good. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Natalie. Sure. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, everyone, for, for your feedback. I might just ask one quick question from the panel before we move on to Kina. Um, and this is just from Jane Marie around generally what is the time like expectation for a presentation in an interview? What are you looking for? Is it does it need to be about 10, 15 minutes, more or less? When you're presenting, so when you're presenting a portfolio, um, I it's about 30 minutes. I think it depends. I mean, like, you know, for someone like me, I would have maybe two use cases to three. I would pick the two to three. Um, my interview with Amazon, it literally, I was presenting about 40 minutes um, and then 20 minutes with questions. Uh, and always say that front. You want to always let them set the expectations up, set the expectations up front that this is exactly how it's going to work. Because some people might interrupt you. I've seen that happen. Like someone's just like, hey, uh, hey, hey, Laura, what about this, right? Um, um, so for me, it's been, it really depends. And so for me, with like three use cases, I think I went to 40 minutes. Yeah, when I, yeah. When, oops, sorry. sorry, I was gonna say when I sat, when I've interviewed and also when I've been in interviews, um, it's like both sides of the table. Uh, it's usually like the presentation case study portion is usually 45 minutes to an hour in total that accounts for questions and conversation that you might have with your interview panel. Um, I don't know if this is a me thing or a research thing, but it, there tends to be a lot of conversation uh, in those presentations. Um, and then I am usually able to get through definitely two, sometimes a third case study. So I usually have it like my presentation set up kind of modularly so that I can have a third one at the end if there's time. And that third one is usually something that is shorter, more simple, more straightforward, a little bit easier to grok in like only 10-ish minutes or so. Um, but kind of building that presentation to be modular really helps with the questions and the conversation and the interruptions. Great. Awesome with that um most of the uh interview experiences i've had which has been quite a few um they will tell you ahead of time what sort of uh interaction they're hoping for um and if they don't you feel free to ask um you can only benefit by asking truly um they want somebody who, who is bringing to the table what they want to hear so go ahead and ask if they they want things usually i would say it's it is you know, try to get through two, two case studies, have a third one on deck in case they're not very talkative. Um, but yeah, like if even 10 to 20 minutes is a pretty good range for a single um, presentation, I would say. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. That was great. Well done, Laura.